Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Uh, today we'll be talking about what's called the surface area of the surface area of revolution. or SOR for short. So the main idea is that a surface of revolution can be generated by any function of x specifically let's assume we have some function of x and this function is valued from some point a to some point b so we'll say maybe it looks like this All right, this is a right here and this point is b So the surface of revolution generated by the surface is the surface that we get when we take this this curve. Um, sorry, the surface of revolution generated by the curve is the surface that we get when we revolve this around one of the axes. So you can choose whichever axis you want to revolve it around. In this case, we're going to start with the x-axis. So if I take this curve and we revolve it around the x-axis, we end up getting a direct carbon copy down uh, on the, the lower half of the plane right here. And at every single point here, you can think of, say, taking um, the surface, the surface, and directly revolving it around the axis, mm -hmm. so that the cross section of the surface is generated by essentially taking the surface and just revolving it around the x-axis. And the the idea is that we want to figure out, say, uh, for a general surface of revolution, there are surface created in this way. What is the surface area of this surface of revolution? Call this surface mm -hmm. S, the big curly S. And the idea, just like before, is going to be to take this surface and cut it up into a whole bunch of small pieces um, and try to base uh, our formula, or the formula that we get, on a Riemann sum approximation to the total area. Um, so what we want to think about is exactly the the, the the correct shape that we end up getting when we rotate this around the axis and specifically what a shape of a small piece of this partition is going to look like. Um, so for example, say, I'll, I'll just kind of show you And this will be an example that we come back to, is we'll actually use the formula that we get to uh, consider this example. If you take, for instance, the function, uh, the exponential function, e to the x, from negative 2 to positive 2, right, this function looks... like this. And if we were to take this function and revolve it around the x-axis, it 
the shape that you end up getting when you do that. is going to be almost like kind of a three-dimensional horn type shape. This is an example that we'll come back to a little bit later on in the lecture. But to kind of see a picture of this, we can, we can go ahead and use uh, any number of online um, graphing calculators. Specifically, I'm using the, uh, what's called the GeoGebra graphing calculator. And um, this right here is a picture of what that, that surface looks like. So this is the surface of revolution generated by the function e to the x on the interval from negative 2 to 2. And you can see very clearly that uh, when you take that curve and you kind of revolve it and rotate it around the x-axis, you get this, um, it's, it's like a, like a horn-shaped uh, shaped surface. So the, the formula that we're going to end up deriving for the surface area of revolution is going to be exactly um, related to the function itself and specifically to the derivative. It's, it's going to be a, a formula that's a little bit more complicated than the arc length formula that we had before, but it's going to be very similar to the arc length formula in, uh, in how we use it and also uh, how we actually derive uh, the, the formula itself. So let's go through and take a, take a look at how we're going to do this. So here's how we uh, derive the formula, the general surface area formula. So what we're going to consider, and I'll erase this right now, for now. So what we're looking for is a Riemann sum approximation to the total surface area of uh, this object, this uh, three-dimensional object. And the idea here is, just like uh, the arc length formula that we have, we're going to consider partitioning our domain into a whole bunch of very small pieces and see what, uh, what, what, what it looks like when we do, do such a thing. So if I partition our domain into uh, n pieces, or the interval from a to b into n pieces, what we end up getting is the following. Right? And we're gonna, just like the arc length formula, we'll consider this straight line on each one of these pieces from the left endpoint to the right endpoint. This is just like we did for the surface area formula. And consider the shape that you get when you rotate this line around the x-axis. So if I do the surface of revolution for this straight line piece right here, make that circle a little bit better. Just a little bit better. What you end up getting is a segment that looks like this. So it's um, sort of like a piece of a cone. And this shape is actually has a name, it's what's called a, a frustum. <coughs> section of a cone. And we have uh, a separate frustum for every single uh, subinterval of the partition, each separate piece of the partition. But what we'll do is we'll call the area of the kth frustum AK.
and what, what we're going to be looking for is exactly an expression for this AK. Because the idea is that uh, this AK, the area of the thrustum, is approximating the total surface area of the surface on that piece. It's not exactly equal to it, but it's an approximation. And as this partition gets smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, the sum of all of these AKs is getting a, becoming a better and better and better approximation of the total surface area. So the sum from k equals 1 to n of these AKs is an approximation to the actual total surface area of the surface. So we'll call this equal to capital S n because this is the, the Riemann sum for uh, the problem that we're looking at right here. Uh, we need to find a correct expression for these AKs in terms of the values of the function and the it actually depend on the derivative of the function as well just like the uh, the formula for the arc length did so the idea is that we want to be able to express each one of these AKs uh, in terms of the function and its derivative and get a correct expression that we can take the limit of as n goes to infinity and just like for uh, the arc length formula, we're going to get a nice integral formula for the surface area of this surface of revolution. So the first thing that we have to consider of consider is how to figure out the surface area of each one of these small pieces, the surface area of the frustum that's highlighted in blue up in this picture right here, because we have n, for a given partition, we have n total frustums, and we want to be able to figure out exactly what the surface area of each one of these pieces is in terms of the values of the function in the function's derivative. So what I've done here is I've just kind of drawn out a sample frustum and I've labeled the, the, the frustum as exactly what it is, which is a section of a cone. So specifically, um, I will call the length of the cap of the cone, the smaller cap right here, small l, little l. We'll call the length of the larger piece of the cone large L, big L, uh, we'll call the, the distance along the x-axis of this cone, the smaller cone, H, and we'll call the distance along the x-axis of, of the larger cone, capital H, and uh, we'll call the radius of the base circle for the smaller cone, a little r, the lowercase r, and the radius of the, the, the bottom circle for the larger cone, we'll call capital R. So we're going to use these uh, these values, these uh, these symbols, to uh, determine the exact surface area, uh, what the surface area of this this blue piece is, um, and this is going to give us a nice formula for the general surface area of the kth frustum in the Riemann sum above. So the first thing we want to know is the surface area of a cone. And it turns out that the surface area of the cone is pi times the radius of the base times the hypotenuse length. So in this case, the surface area of the smaller cone is pi times r times lowercase l. The surface area of the larger cone is pi times big R times big L. So the surface area of the frustum I'll just call it A with a sub F right here is given by the surface area of the larger cone pi times R times L minus the surface area of the smaller cone which is pi times lowercase r times lowercase l. And this is going to be the formula that we're going to base our calculation of ak on, because we want to figure out what ak is for each one of the, the, the k pieces, or each one of the n pieces in our partition. So in order to do this, what we want to do is figure out exactly how L 
in R relate to the parameters of the cone, of the values of the cone. Uh, specifically, we know that the cone uh, is has some slope because it's given by a line, right? And this line is in general going to be given, we'll call it the function g of x, the line. line of the cone is given by g of x is equal to m times x minus x naught. Here uh, x naught uh, is just the, the very uh, the, the point of intersection right here. Right. The, so the idea is that g of x is m times x minus x naught, which is the equation of a line that's starting here at a centered point of the intersection point of the cone. So this is the equation of the line, you know, the top of the cone right here, where m is the slope of that line. So the main thing to, to realize is that uh, both L, capital L and little l are arc lengths and we can use the arc length formula to determine exactly what these arc lengths are, are in terms of m, the slope of the cone. Right, uh, if you remember the formula from the arc length lecture, right, l, the arc length of this line, is going to be the integral from 0 to h of the square root of 1 plus, and I guess that the bounds actually aren't 0 and h, the bounds are from x naught, the center point of the cone, to x naught plus h of 1 plus g prime of x squared dx. And we're going to see very quickly that uh, this simplifies very nicely because g prime is just equal to m. And what that gives us, when we take the derivative of this expression right here, the derivative of this with respect to x is just equal to m. It's constant. This means that this l is equal to the integral from x naught to x naught plus h of the square root of 1 plus m squared. And 1 plus m squared is constant with respect to x. So this comes out of the integral. And you get the integral of just 1 dx from x naught to x naught plus h, which is just equal to x naught plus h minus x naught or h itself. So uh, because of that, this L is equal to the square root of 1 plus m squared times h. And we have a nice expression for the hypotenuse length of this smaller cone, and it turns out that uh, these calculations proceed exactly the same for the hypotenuse length of the larger cone, and we get that capital L, the larger cone, is going to be the square root of 1 plus m squared times capital H. And I encourage you to go through and show that uh, directly how I did up here. It's really the same calculations uh, just over a larger length. <clears throat> but what this means for us is that uh, our formula for uh, the area of the frustum, the, the surface area of the frustum, simplifies a little bit. We had before that it's pi times r times l, and because l is the square root of 1 plus m squared times h, this is going to be pi times r times the square root of 1 plus m squared times capital H. 
minus pi times r, a little r, times the square root of 1 plus m squared times little, little h, or lowercase h. Which we can write a little bit more simply by factoring out a pi, because there's a pi common to both term, and fa factoring out the square root of 1 plus m squared. And we have a slightly simplified formula and uh, that, that, that we can, we're going to be able to use. So unfortunately we're not done just yet, but we're one step closer. The next step for this simplification is to consider uh, what R, capital R and lowercase r, uh, both of them are in terms of just H alone, H by itself. And we can do that fairly simply by thinking of uh, exactly how uh, this distance right here and this distance right here relate to the function g of x. Sure enough, uh, out for the lower cone, for the smaller cone, all right, r, the radius of that smaller cone, is exactly equal to the value of g of x. at x naught plus h, or the value of the function g of x at this point right here. And if g of x is x minus x naught, that means that g of x naught plus h is going to be m times x naught plus h minus x naught, which is just our formula for the line. So this means that lowercase r is just going to be m times h. This is an expression for lowercase r in terms of just m and the height, or sorry, in the, uh, m and the distance of the cone along the x-axis, the smaller cone. And using similar logic, we'll see that uh, you can see very clearly that capital R is just going to be equal to m times capital H. So these relations for the cone uh, give us another simplified formula for the frustum. We can kind of plug into our previous formula to get that uh, the area, the surface area of the frustum is equal to pi times the square root of 1 plus m squared times r, which is m times h, capital R, times h minus m times lowercase h times lowercase h right here. Which, if you factor out an m, simplifies to the following formula. It's going to be that AF, the area of the frustum, and I'll, I'll write this on the next page so we're not too cluttered here. AF is equal to pi times m times the square root of 1 plus m squared times capital H squared minus lowercase h squared. And uh, we want to have uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, do a little bit more uh, of a simplification here. We're almost done and almost, this is almost in the final form uh, for simplification purposes. The main thing to note is that h squared minus h squared, or big H squared minus lowercase h squared, is the same thing as h minus h, lowercase, capital H minus lowercase h, times capital H, h plus, plus lowercase h.
So this expression can be rewritten as pi times m times the square root of 1 plus m squared times h plus capital H plus lowercase h times capital H minus lowercase h. Or if we rewrite this a little bit further, and we'll see why this is going to be important in one second, this is going to be pi times m, and actually I want to include this, it's going to be 2 pi times m times h plus lowercase h over 2 times the square root of 1 plus m squared times h minus h. Where I just multiply by 2 and divide by 2. So I haven't changed this expression at all. It's still the same expression. Uh, but it turns out that this is our key result. This is the the the, the you know the, the the most simplification that we need to do, and this is going to be in the perfect form for us to determine uh, exactly what we want to determine. The main the main idea here is to interpret what each one of these values is uh, directly and use that uh, when we go through and. Uh, in, in essentially determine the, uh, the the expression for a k. So uh, remember that this this is the general formula for any frustum and how it relates to the slope of the frustum and the the width of the frustum. In this case, h minus h is the width of the frustum, and h plus h over two, or capital H plus h over two, is the average or the the midpoint right in the middle of the frustum itself. So right here. So what this translates to directly is the following. Well, for our, for our, our purposes right here, um, for AK, the area of the kth frustum, this is going to be 2 times pi times mk, where mk is the slope of the the the, the kth frustum, h is the the value, in, or we'll say the uh, xk plus xk minus 1 over 2 times the square root of 1 plus mk squared times delta x k. The delta x k is h minus h. It's the, the width of uh, the kth frustum. Uh, 1 plus square root of 1 plus m squared is just the mk squared is the mk is the slope of the kth frustum xk plus xk minus 1 over 2 is that midpoint it's the midpoint of the kth frustum and uh, mk right here is the again the slope of the kth frustum it's coming directly from that that area formula that we derived for a general frustum <clears throat> remember that mk is delta yk over delta xk. And just like before from the mean value theorem, I talked about this in the derivation of the formula for arc length. Uh, we have that from the mean value theorem. On every subinterval, there exists a ck such that the derivative of our function at ck is equal to this mk. 
This is from the, the mean value theorem part one from differential calculus. So the differential mean value theorem. And what that means for us is that in our formula, uh, this MK becomes, uh, there exists some CK where F prime of CK, uh, MK is equal to the derivative at that CK. This MK right here is the derivative of F at that same CK, that CK from the mean value theorem. And then lastly, you have to multiply by the, the width delta XK. <clears throat> and what that means is that uh, we, we can go ahead and directly use this in our Riemann sum if we want, but there's even a nicer thing that we can do. Um, as n gets larger and larger and larger, this f prime times the midpoint is getting closer and closer and closer to the actual value of the function at that point. It's like saying that the difference between the, the function on every subinterval, in this case, this is the value of the frustum at the midpoint, and this is the value of the function at the midpoint. So that difference is very, very small when n is very large. So we can say that a k is going to be approximately equal to 2 pi, this entire thing right here is approximately equal to just the value of f at c k times the square root of 1 plus f prime of c k times delta xk. So the, the Riemann sum Sn is for large values of n equal to the summation from k equals 1 to n of 2 pi times f of ck times the square root of 1 plus f prime of ck times delta xk. And the limit of this Riemann sum as n goes to infinity is exactly equal to the surface area. So the surface area of the surface of revolution is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum Sn which is exactly equal to the integral from a to b of 2 pi f of x times the square root of 1 plus, well, it should be squared right here, f prime of x squared dx. And this is exactly the formula that I was talking about before. This gives us directly an integral formula for the surface area of any surface of revolution given a function f. So what's what's nice about this formula is it has uh, a lot of kind of, uh, it's very intuitive. Um, uh, the derivation is a little bit long. Uh, you've, you've seen that in the, 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 this lecture so far. But the idea is that uh, it's intuitive in the sense that uh, what this is saying is we're, we're taking the, the integral of the circumference of each individual circle. So in, in this case, of, if you look at the surface area of revolution, um, the, each cross section that you have is a circle. The circumference of the circle is 2 pi times the radius of the circle. That's 2 pi times f of x. Um, so integrating that on the curve itself with respect to the arc length, um, is exactly uh, giving us the value of the surface area. So it's a very, very cool idea that if you have, uh, you know, that your circumference function as a function of x, 
you can integrate that function to directly get the surface area of revolution. Um, so let's go back to uh, the example that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, and we'll kind of see this in action, so to speak. So we'll consider the function y equals e to the x, and we'll do a smaller interval. We'll just do it for x from 0 to the number ln of 3, natural log of 3. If, for instance, we open up our plot from before of the function. Let me just open that up again. This is going to correspond to the following. the surface area of revolution of the function e to the x from 0 to 3 looks like this. And let's see if we can rotate this a little bit. It's taking a little, little bit of time to load. For some reason, it doesn't want to rotate for me. But the, the idea is that I think it should be pretty clear that um, this is what our surface looks like. Here we go. It's rotating right there. So if we take the function e to the x for x from... 0 to ln of 3, this is uh, exactly what we get. And I'll, I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can, you can all kind of see this through one full uh, revolution. For some reason, it doesn't want to rotate when we're at that big. So I'll keep, I'll keep it at the, this size, and then we'll rotate it. So the number that we're going to calculate is going to be the surface area of this surface right here. So in order to, to do this, we're going to end up going through and using the formula. So from the formula we just arrived, it's going to be the integral from 0 to ln of 3 of the function 2 pi times e to the x times the square root of 1 plus f prime. Remember, if f of x is e to the x, then f prime of x is the derivative of e to the x, which is just e to the x itself. So it's going to be f prime squared dx. So this is the, the integral that we need to go through and evaluate. So the easiest way of doing this, I think, is first to do a u substitution. And we'll do u is equal to e to the x. Which means that du will be the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x dx. 
So this integral becomes 2 pi times the integral, and then when x is 0, u is e to the 0, or 1. And when x is equal to ln of 3, u is equal to e to the ln of 3. So the upper bound becomes then e to the ln of 3, which is just 3. And this will be the square root of 1 plus u squared. And e to the x dx is just equal to du. And let's make this a we'll make this a little bit smaller. So we're not overwhelmed by all of the symbols here. So if we go through and we remember that th this is actually, um, you know, uh, if you remember. So this this integral now is a new integral that we have to evaluate, um, and the idea is that this this integral is uh, an integral that uh, we can get using um, our, our our trigonometric substitution. And it's a nice trigonometric substitution integral. Uh, specifically, if you do uh, the trigonometric substitution, um, you, you'll end up seeing. And I'm pretty sure we did this integral in class, um, but uh, it, it'll definitely be, I can, I can go over how to get this integral via trigonometric substitution if you want to see that uh, at a later time. I can definitely go over that with you if you want. Just let me know and uh, I can kind of remind you how to do a trigonometric substitution here. But when we ended up doing that, we ended up getting the, the following result. That the integral of uh, the square root of 1 plus x squared and it'd be a good idea to go through and practice it for yourself but if you do a tangent substitution here u equals tangent of theta uh, this antiderivative ends up becoming exactly equal to the following it's going to be 1 half u times the square root of 1 plus u squared plus 1 half the natural log of the absolute value of the square root of 1 plus u squared plus u. evaluated from 3 to 1. So this requires uh, a little bit of simplification here. We have to plug in all of the, you know, these values and kind of simplify. The first thing that we can do is factor out a 1 half here. Is it a 2 right here? So that, that's going to go away and this is going to become pi times 3 plugged in right here, which is 3 times the square root of 1 plus 3 squared, which is 1 plus 9, or 10, plus the natural log of square root of 10 plus 3. <coughs> We have to subtract from all of this with one plugged in to this, this antiderivative. That's going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 2, <coughs> plus natural log of the square root of 2 plus 1. And this value that we get is exactly the value of the surface area of this surface of revolution. So we can simplify this a uh, decent amount by, uh, in some sense, rewriting what we have here. So this is going to be 
the 3 times the square root of 10 minus square root of 2. So this simplifies to the following. It's going to be pi times 3 root 10 minus root 2. And then uh, natural log of 10 plus root 10 plus 3 minus natural log of root 2 plus 1 is the same thing as natural log of root 10 plus 3 over root 2 plus 1. And this value is exactly the value of the surface area of that surface of revolution. So this gives a you know a concrete example of how we can use this formula directly. Now there's one other formula that, that's important. Uh, I'm not going to go through the derivation of how to get this formula, but I, I will mention the formula. Um, suppose instead of revolving around the x-axis, we choose to revolve around the y-axis. And what you want to think about is, and I'll, I'll copy the formula just so that we, we remember it, the general formula that we have for the surface area when we revolve around the x-axis is this formula right here. I'll make it a little bit smaller. That it fits up here. And we don't we don't need the, the Riemann sum limit because the main formula here is that the surface area is around the x axis is equal to this. And you see uh, that this formula is exactly that. It's the, the integral from A to B of the circumference, which is this right here about the x-axis. It's some C of x. It's the circumference function, uh, the cross-sectional circumference, times uh, the square root of 1 plus f prime squared dx. It turns out that um, we can do this actually around any axis we want. If we have uh, a formula for this the cross-sectional circumference um, the, then the this, the formula will be valid so it turns out that when we revolve around not the x-axis but the y-axis so you have a function say that looks like this and instead of revolving around the x-axis we revolve this around the y-axis. So revolving around the y-axis gives us a surface that sort of looks like this. So if we go through the same procedure that we went through before to derive a surface area formula, the surface area around the y-axis, remember this is uh, you put subscript of x right here. This is, this is revolving around the x-axis, revolving around the y-axis. The formula will be very, very similar. 
but instead of having 2 pi times f of x, the circumference around the y-axis is the circumference of the circle going around like this. So it's really the 2 pi times the absolute value of x. That's the circumference of any cross section at any value, uh, any value of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. And one, one more note, uh, in order to make this work in general even for negative functions, you go, you're going to want to put an absolute value on f of x. which is what, what happens when you go through and do the derivation for this surface area formula for on the y-axis. So really the, the, the most accurate formula here um, should have an absolute value in it. Because uh, in general f of x could be both positive or ne negative. So you want to be as general as possible. Um, but this is the most general formula for surface area about the x-axis or of rotation around the x-axis and down here, uh, this is the most general formula for surface area of revolution around the y-axis. And these two formulas allow us to calculate the surface area of any surface that can be expressed as a surface area of revolution, which uh, f actually describes a large amount of surfaces. If you think of it as a circle or an ellipse or really any other type of um, uh, relatively simple geometric shape and even quite complicated geometric shapes, we can use this formula to compute the surface area. But that, that's the end of the lecture today. Thank you very much for tuning in.